Please don't skip ahead yet. Hi, this is your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian, Josh LaRue. Just need a moment of your time. A lot of people don't know, but we're not able to monetize the channel here on YouTube due to the fact that the copyright holders of the books I narrate, the movies we riff, they get the ad revenue, and also being a partner on YouTube involves a lot of rules and censorship, and to do so would make it where a lot of the content, the audiobooks, the riffs, would have to be heavily censored or deleted completely. So we depend on amazing slashaholics like you to help fund the channel and keep it going and growing for years to come. And there's several fun ways to do that. You could join our Patreon right up there. And as a patron, you can join for as low as like $2, $5, $10 a month on up as high as you want. And enjoy a lot of cool gifts like free ebooks, early access, exclusive content, even voicing characters and audiobooks here on the channel. You could also go to our PayPal and use the QR code right there. And uh, you can donate directly to the channel. We see all donations and we appreciate all of them. If you don't want to use the QR code or don't know how, you can use our PayPal email address, which will be in the description below and the pinned comment, as well as our Cash App uh, donation username. And a fun way to help the channel is through our Cameo right down there. Uh, on Cameo, you can ask for a birthday video, anniversary video. You can ask us to sing a song or something or ask us questions. And you can get a video from me, Alex, Sean, Master Evil, Mother Evil, the Rodeo Clown, any character from any show on the channel, or any character that I've voiced in the audiobooks. It's a fun way to help the channel. It's only $10 a video, and we'll have a lot of fun doing that. So thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoy tonight's content. Be excellent to each other. Please consider helping the channel. And always remember, the sun never sets on those who ride into it. Thank you. Happy Halloween, Slashaholics. I started a Halloween tradition last year by uh, narrating Edgar Allan Poe's The Telltale Heart for Halloween. This year, I'm going to narrate The Raven. Uh, might not be as good as what I did last year, but uh, this is one of my favorite uh, Edgar Allan Poe works, and I thought it would be great to do this year. So, uh, here it is. Everybody have a fun and safe Halloween, and I hope you enjoy my reading of The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping as if someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Tis some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this and nothing more. Ah, oh, distinctly I remember, it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow from my books or cease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before. So that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is, and nothing more." Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door. Then I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door, darkness there, and nothing more. <laughs> Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore? This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore? Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning. Soon again I heard a tapping, somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see then what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. 
Open here I flung the shutter, when with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mine of lord or lady, perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace just above my chamber door, perched and sat and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plutonian shore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little revelance bore. For we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door, with such name as nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on the placid bus, spoke only that one word as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing farther than he uttered, not a feather, then he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, Doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and store, Caught from some unhappy master, whom unmerciful disaster, Followed fast and followed faster, till his songs one burden bore, Till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore, Of never, never more. But the raven still beguiling all my fancy into smiling, Straight I willed a cushioned seat in front of a bird and bust and door, then upon the velvet sinking I betook myself to the linking, fancy unto fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore, <laughs> meant in croaking, nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er, but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er she shall press off oh, nevermore. Then methought the air grew denser, perfume from an unseen censer, swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, that God hath lent thee, by these angels he has sent thee, respite, respite, and nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, oh, quaff this kind nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter sin or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore, desolate yet all undaunted on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead, tell me, tell me, I implore, quoth the raven, Nevermore, prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet, still, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell the soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels name Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked up starting, get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore, leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul has spoken, leave my loneliness unbroken, quit the bust above my door, take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door, quoth the raven, nevermore.
And the raven never flitting still is sitting, still is sitting on that pallid bust of palace just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight over him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. Well, I hope you enjoyed my reading of The Raven. A little slip into madness every time you heard the word uh, nevermore. And uh, some real uh, anger at the end. I've always loved that poem. Just the emotions. The relaxation kind of at the beginning. Then the sadness, remembering his lost love. You know, then like this bird driving him crazy. And then, uh, not just crazy, but angry. I just the, the flow of emotions in Edgar Allan Poe's writing of The Raven is just something I really, really enjoy. And now, uh, I'm going to play the uh, Telltale Heart recording I did last year for Halloween. Uh, so yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, here is The Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe. True. Nervous. Very, very very dreadfully nervous I had been and am. But why will you say that I am mad? The disease has sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken, and observe how healthily, <clears throat> how calmly, I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain, but once conceived it haunted me day and night. Object there was none, passion there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me, he had never given me insult. For his gold I had no desire. I think it was his eye, yes, it was this. He had the eye of a vulture, a pale blue eye with the film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold, and so by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man, and thus rid myself of the eye forever. Now this is the point you fancy me mad. Madmen know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded. With what caution. With what foresight. With what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night about midnight I turned the latch of his door and opened it, oh so gently. And then, when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, I put in a dark lantern, all closed, closed, that no light shone out. And then I thrust in my head, oh you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. Ha! Would a madman have been so wise as this? And then, when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously, oh, so cautiously, cautiously, for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights, every night just at midnight. But I found the eye always closed, and so it was impossible to do the work. For it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him calling him by name in a hearty tone and inquiring how he has passed the night. So you see, he would have been a very profound old man indeed to suspect that every night just at twelve 
I looked in upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers, of my sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph, to think that there I was, opening the door, little by little, and he not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly chuckled at the idea, and perhaps he heard me, for he moved on the bed suddenly, as if startled. Now you may think that I drew back, but no. His room was as black as pitch, with the thick darkness, for the shutters were closed fastened through fear of robbers. And so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door, and I kept pushing it on steadily, steadily. I had my head in and was about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening and the old man sprang up in bed, crying out, Who's there? I kept quiet, still, and said nothing. For a whole hour I did not move a muscle, and in the meantime I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed listening, just as I have done night after night, hearkening to the death watches in the wall. Presently I heard a slight groan, and I knew I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or of grief, oh no, it was the low stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew the sound well, many a night, just at midnight, when all the world slept, it has welled up from my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo the terrors that distracted me. I say I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt and pitied him, although I chuckled at heart. I knew that he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise. When he had turned in the bed, his fears had been ever since growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy them causeless, but could not. He had been saying to himself, It is nothing but the wind in the chimney. It is only a mouse crossing the floor, or it is merely a cricket which has made a single chirp. Yes, he had been trying to comfort himself with those suppositions, but he had found all in vain, all in vain, because death in approaching him had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, although he neither saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little, a very, very little crevice in the lantern. So I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until at length a simple dim ray, like the thread of the spider, shot from out the crevice and fell upon the vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, all a dull blue with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow in my bones, but I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person. For I had directed the ray as if by instinct precisely upon the damp spot. And have I not told you that what you mistake for madness is but over-acuteness of the sense? Now, I say, there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. But even yet I refrained and kept still. 
I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say, louder every moment. Do you mark me well? I have told you that I am nervous. So I am. And now at the dead hour of the night, amid the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet for some minutes longer I refrained and stood still. But the beating grew louder louder i thought the heart must burst and now a new anxiety seized me the sound would be heard by a neighbor the old man's hour had come with the loud yell i threw open the lantern and leaped into the room he shrieked once once only in an instant i dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done, but for many minutes the heart beat on with the muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length it ceased. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. Yes, he was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. If you still think me mad, you will think so no longer. When I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body, the night waned and I worked hastily but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. I then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the board so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot, whatever. I had been too wary for that. A tub had caught all. <laughs> when I had made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart, for what had I now to fear? There entered three men who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police office, and they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled, for what had I to fear? I bade the gentlemen welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man I mentioned was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search, search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasure secure, undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues, while I myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted of familiar things. But ere long I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears, but they still sat and still chatted. The ringing became more distinct. It 
continued and became more distinct, I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and gained definitiveness until at length I found that the noise was not within my ears. No doubt I now grew very pale, but I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice. Yet the sound increased, and what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound, much such a sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath, and yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased. I arose and argued about trifles in a high key with violent gesticulations, but the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides, as if excited to fury by the observations of these men. The noise steadily increased. Oh, God, what could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore. I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting and grated it upon the boards. But the noise arose over all and continually increased. It grew louder, louder and louder, and still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard not? Almighty God! No! No, they heard! They suspected! They knew! They were making a mockery of my horror! This I thought and this I think! But anything was better than this agony! Anything was more tolerable than this derision. I could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I must scream or die. And now again, hark louder, 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 louder. Villains, I shrieked. Dissemble no more, I admit the deed. Tear up the planks. Here, here, it is the beast of his hideous heart. Okay, Slashaholics, I hope you enjoyed my Edgar Allan Poe readings of The Raven and my reading from last year, uh, The Telltale Heart. Uh, I'll be back next Halloween with another Edgar Allan Poe reading. Uh, maybe we'll do a poll and you guys can uh, vote on which one I do next year. Uh, I have a lot of fun doing these. I know I'm not the greatest narrator in the world. Uh, may not have the right voice for Poe, but I do like the whole slipping into insanity thing he does with some of his writing, and I uh, have fun with it, and that's all that matters. And I hope some of you have enjoyed it. Happy Halloween. Uh, be safe, but have fun. Go get the hell scared out of you today and tonight, especially tonight. Um, and just just have a hell of a Halloween. Uh, wish the best for all of you. I'll be back very soon with more great content here on the channel. Until then, thanks for listening. Like I said, happy Halloween, and uh, I'll see you next time.